Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Digital Artcast. Um, we are now at year's end. Uh, it has been a great 2020. Um, I just wanted to, before we rolled on this next episode, talk about uh, my thanks for everybody who's been listening. Uh, we've made a lot of progression and we've had a really great year uh, and just so many amazing guests uh, that it's been almost unbelievable to, you know, the caliber of people that came on to talk to me. Um, so just a general thanks to all my guests that have came on and talked to me and of course for everybody here who has listened um, not only this year but probably multiple years since the podcast inception um, and as you've noticed we are changing formats and slightly that you know we're trying to expand our realm of understanding and bring in different disciplines from around the industry um, not just visual artists but other types of artists other types of people within the industry um, just to broaden the horizon um, I know that the the podcast's initial focus was, of course, artists and industry. Um, But I think it's good to just always step outside your circle and uh, and intake as much information as you can uh, from different sources, because then I think it just makes you just a more well-rounded person in general. Um, So, yeah, so again with today, uh, a slight change up where we have uh, a great guest an amazing guest in fact but uh, one who uh, has a slightly different discipline in the fact that he is um, you know he's, he's, he's an audio engineer he's a composer he uh, is probably best known for his work on you know multiple games and movies um, across the industry working on sound design and uh, and yeah it was just a great honour to get him along to talk to us um, about his work uh, and everything that he's done. So um, if you guys can, can please help me welcome along uh, today's guest, Mr. Ross Tregenza. Hey, Ross. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, a pleasure indeed. Um, yeah, so I mean, just initially, uh, the reason I think, um, well, I mean, I, funny enough, I was already trying to get you on the podcast before you announced this, but <laughs> um, now that you have, uh, congratulations on your work in Cyberpunk. Oh, thank you very much. It's- incredible honor to be part of that game it's just it's so huge and so cool yes it's uh i think you know they were saying stuff like you know they turned a profit on day one it's like you know the fastest selling one of the fastest selling pc games you know over like a million users on steam it's 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 pretty crazy the hype that's surrounding that game just now it's it's uh it's it's not a landmark in, in video game history really it's really cool yeah, I think just also because people have been really anticipating this game for so long. It's you know, I think I think that the first time I heard of it was uh not long after I left my job as an engineer to try and pursue my dream. So uh yeah, like twenty thirteen, twenty twelve or something was when, you know, the, the rumors were starting. I think the initial kind of talks about, you know, they'd bought the license, they were building a game. Yeah. Um so like something like eight years. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, crazy. Um so apart from cyberpunk obviously that's a that's a big accolade now obviously for that to be on your resume but um you know your work goes very far back um not trying to make you sound old ross but <laughs> but at the same time yeah you you've had your your hands in the industry for a while now so for people who don't know you um could you just run just a quick intro of who you are and what you do yeah sure so um i've worked as either a composer or sound designer for like I say, it's a long time now. I think uh, uh, my composing work predates my sound design by a few years. I think it's been 17 years of, of composing for games now. Uh, first one being Time Splitters 2 that I just did one track for. And then that mm-hmm. with the um, composer and audio director, Graham Norgate, on that, that that became a long-term working relationship. We, we worked. I did a bit more for Time Splitters 3. Uh, mm-hmm. Then I joined Free Radical, uh, Free Radical that... Uh, in Nottingham, uh, not around anymore, but an amazing games company. Uh, and mm-hmm. so from there, uh, trying to sort of get the, the sequence right, we worked on the game 
uh, Hayes, and then a Star Wars game that sadly never came out. Um, mm-hmm. I was down at uh, Rebellion in Oxford, and we worked on Alien vs. Predator and a few other titles there. Then right. we went to Crytek, where we worked on the uh, the Crisis games, which was that was awesome. Real real pleasure working on those. That was Crisis one, two, and three. Fantastic. Yeah, and then uh, what we got from there? Then Homefront, for, <laughs> which was that became um, uh, Deep Silver Dambuster out of the the ashes of Crytek Nottingham. Then from there, right. up to Manchester for Star Citizen, back down to Nottingham again for um, Sumo Nottingham, where we've done uh, Team Sonic Racing and Hot Shot Racing. Um, and then there's been a load of uh, sort of freelance, uh, mostly composing for the freelance work in between that. Right. Uh, Gears of War, right. Wolfenstein, Youngblood, and uh, a few other titles. Right, Grant. So, yeah, I'd definitely had a packed resume in terms of just things you've worked on. I mean, even the fact that you were one of the original team for the Crisis games is a huge accolade in itself. Um, I know those games, you know, of course, were, were legendary even back then, but now, of course, it's like, you know, I think one of the games that everybody looks to is the gold standard for FPSs and just games in general. Um, I know we had uh, Marek Maggi, eh, no, Marek Maggi, we had uh, Maciej Kutiara on uh, not too long ago, and he was also part of the original Crisis team as well on, on the art side, and I think anybody who's been around to have touched that at one point is definitely, you know, has some kind of legendary title anyway because it's it's such an icon now in the industry. But then, of course, you've been freelance. You've, you've, like you said, you've done stuff for Wolfenstein and other pieces, you know, around, yeah. you know, and composing, doing some some design for for trailers, right, for cuts for trailers for movies and stuff like that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's really it's funny actually how different the worlds of um, um, composing for video game and composing for film are, like. Um, I've done very little in in the realm of films, really, more just just uh, trailer. Mm-hmm. But you think, right. considering you know the the final results of the sound design and the composing of uh, you, you, you're ending up with music and sound design, you think there would be a huge right. amount of like commonality in those two industries, but they're they're incredibly different. It's kind of fascinating how bizarrely different they are. Like if I talk to someone from uh, a sound designer or a composer from the film industry, it's like. Mm-hmm. Um, we're both fascinated by each other's disciplines, but they're they're, they're insanely different. It's really strange, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I think it's even where sometimes you'll try to understand that you know the the visual identity of games. You know, you'll design for games as a concept artist or concept designer or, or environment artist, whatever. But then when you switch to film, yeah, there is definitely a different aesthetic. You know, I, I know. Going to events previously, I've spoke to both games artists and movie artists, and yeah, they do seem to live in different realms. Although pr- pr- primarily, their job is to uh, solve problems visually and you know draw and paint. So, I mean, for you, what have you felt has been in you know your gut feeling of where you feel most comfortable? Do you think you live more for games at this at this current moment? Yeah, I mean, um, I I will always be interested in like sound designing and composing uh, for. Any, anything really, anything that comes up that's intriguing that I can write music for will be a pleasure to do. But my background now is so uh, heavily in games. And um, right. yeah, I, I've been very lucky, been uh, very grateful for the, the opportunities I've had and everything. And I'm kind of pretty deep into uh, game audio and, and game composing now. So I'm sure that will probably yeah. be the um, the, yeah, the main slant of my work forever. And maybe I'll, I'll, there'll be some opportunities in film or other areas, but if, if I was to mm. be working forever in, in video games now, I'd be you know, more than happy with that. It's Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's what, what's, the, what's the general vibe on how you found your voice in the industry? I mean, like, was that initially that you came from a background of creating music for yourself and then yeah. you wanted to make that, you know, a full-time job? So, you know, was it just that you wanted to make music for anybody at the time or did you have a, already in your mind very long that you wanted to compose for games? Um, I think... Uh, I, I kind of uh, from from the, this like older generation of um, sound designers and composers for games that a lot of us really came from just a general music background sort of and were fans of video games and drifted into the industry in that way. Obviously, a lot of young sound designers now will, will go uh, to university and, and stuff and, and you know, study very directly for that role. But I was um, right. I was just I was a musician. I um, I had a sort of a electro industrial band and I was trying to take over the world with my band which didn't work <laughs> so, um, <laughs> as time went on yeah I, I was yeah, happily doing my band and um I think one day I, I uh 
I'd met uh, Graham Norgate, the uh, the audio director from Free Radical, and uh, and he got me to do just one song for for one of his games, and that was just kind of an eye opener. I hadn't really, as much as I loved the the music in games, it just hadn't really clicked for me that that is something I could be doing. Like I could I could match my love for video games with my love for music. Uh, so and after that. Yeah, we went on to Time Splitters Three, and, and I got more involved. And I, as time went on, I started realizing that this this is something that could be my life from now on. So it was a, kind of a slow dawning realization that this is probably what I should be doing with my life. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like I think it's even interesting to to talk about your beginnings because it does also sound like a lot of the guys I spoke to who are visual artists. You know, they they drew and painted as a hobby, and then eventually learned that oh, people are paid to do this for games. Like, you know, how do I get a slice of that cake? So, you know, it, it's been a very uh, common thing, I think, for creatives is that there was this whole uh, art explosion in the 80s and 90s. And then all of a sudden, you know, like this industry came along and then people realized that they could be part of it because it was a creative industry and they were creative. So, I mean, I think it's just like, you know, you found your your calling, your home, because there was an industry to take it in, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is that something that, I mean... Pretty early on, I'm, I'm guessing it was hard still to make a living even back then when you were working on games. It was probably a very, you know, because the games industry itself is so young, right? So what were the, the early days of composing back then compared to now? What were they like? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, when I was first doing just bits and pieces of work for people for games, uh, I was really still just jumping on any opportunity, but it wasn't uh, enough to make a living. I was still uh, working uh, just sort of jobs in, in shops and things like that, just to right. Yeah. Rent. Um, and I was hoping one day uh, I could get like a, a place in a studio and, and work full time, or you know, right. and then hopefully eventually also take on a lot more freelance work. But it's um, I'm, I'm sure it's the same with any uh, sort of freelance creative mm-hmm. discipline. It's uh, the, that initial mountain is is, is pretty steep to uh, just to get. To claim. Yeah, to, to get that first yeah. work and um, to sort of build some momentum, it's, yeah, it's it's like sort of wading through jam for the for the, for the first years, just trying to, <laughs> to get that work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, it, I mean, I definitely feel like there's a time and a place for people to to try that freelance world. Um, I think, especially when you're younger, um, you try to venture out and find your own voice in the industry. Um, and then some people kind of stay that way forever or eventually will try and go back into the fold and, you know, like find, you know, a studio that suits their, their kind of creative outlet or their, their needs at the time for family or for work or whatever. Um, I mean, you've been freelance now for about four or five years now, right? So, I mean, what's the what's the general consensus moving forward? Do you think you would want to try and eventually maybe venture back into studios kind of full time or are you still kind of loving what you're doing? In, um, a, a really awesome but quite unusual situation that um, I work full time as the audio lead and composer for Sumo Nottingham, but uh, okay. But they also uh, when I was when the, the the studio was very young, the uh, the director at the time in, invited me down and wanted me to start the audio team, and I'd I'd said to him uh, I, I do a lot of freelance now, and um, you know it, it wouldn't be interrupting my my work that I do during day you know day work hours but it's something that i feel very passionate about and want to continue with so i have a, a right. unusual uh contract with them that as long as it's not any sort of direct competitor or anything that's gonna or and certainly that it doesn't interrupt my work for them they're happy that uh sumo nottingham are happy for me to uh compose as, as a freelancer outside of my work hours so i basically mm-hmm. I, I kind of do two jobs i guess i, I i'm working primarily for, for sumo nottingham and then uh, when things like cyberpunk come along, then uh, I spend my uh, all the rest of my time doing that. <laughs> yeah, about my music. <laughs> that, I mean that's got, that's got to be intense because I think, as you'll probably well know, holding out, you know, one job is difficult enough. But never mind, you know. I mean, I know. I mean, I'm saying this. I know people who do it who you know have a full time job at like Creative Assembly or Sega or other different companies, but then of course at night they come home and do stuff for magic the gathering or any kind of freelance stuff so those people do exist but i think i mean more more because i don't understand fully your uh pipeline h- how you would you know spend all day audio engineering stuff for for sumo and then also taking on a project like cyberpunk because i mean of course you know sumo has some massive ips and some you know huge games that they work on yeah. but then cyberpunk itself was like 
such an undertaking. Um, I mean, in essence, uh, we could probably talk about that later in more depth as well, but then how did that opportunity come initially then for you to work with CD Projekt Red? Uh, that was really uh, through uh, just a, a contact of mine. Um, uh, Colin Walder, who's an audio coder for, for the game, he um, right. he joined the industry uh, at Free Radical uh the same place that I started in the industry back in uh, the, what's it, about 2007, 2008. Uh, he went from Free Radical up to uh, uh, Rockstar and worked on GTA V and then over hey. for, uh, for The Witcher and then on to Cyberpunk. <laughs> he's he's, he's right. got a, an awesome CV. But he's uh, oh, a yeah. great guy. <laughs> and, um, he's, uh, we've always enjoyed working with, with each other when opportunities have arrived. And um, on Cyberpunk they were working on the game and realized that they had a bit of a, uh, a shortfall in terms of like all the, the adverts and TV trailers and things like that in the game. And right. they realized they needed somebody to do it. So being the lovely chap that he is, he, uh, he, he spoke to me and then put me forward. So I, uh, I checked with, uh, with Sumo Nottingham and they were happy with that. So uh, we, we went ahead with it. Mm-hmm. And um, that was the beginning of a lot of yeah. crazy fun work. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I, I don't know if this is a specific you can talk about, but then how long ago were you contacted for the initial like conversation about working on the game? Was that like a few years back now? Or uh, I'm trying to think. It's kind of a blur now. I think it's about yeah. over a year ago. I, I'd like to say. I think. Um, I think we we started talking about that it might happen. It might even be like a year and a half or longer ago now. And I think right. the work in earnest began about a year ago. I think now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, like even then, uh, a year might seem a long time to people, but then again, depending on what the scope was for what you were working on, you know, time is just an illusion. You know, because if they wanted you to create, you know, several hundred jingles or TV adverts, then of course you're thinking to yourself, "Well, how do I split that over twelve months? How am I going to, you know, manage that? How am I going to break it up?" I mean, in essence, I think it's different as well because you talked about, you know, the difference between games and films in terms of composing. But then, if you're then composing things like TV jingles or adverts, is there also a different process to that as well? Although it's still within games, um, yeah, it's weirdly it's it's kind of become uh, uh, like a specialty of mine, I guess, uh, for creating uh, in-world music. Uh, okay, um, I did it for Star Citizen and Homefront uh, and right. Design. They're all all this music, like sometimes played over the radio, sometimes, you know, TV adverts, things like that. But um, it is actually, it's, it's quite different from, from pure scoring for, for video games. There's sort of different requirements and different uh, limitations. I mean, you have to, um, especially for cyberpunk, uh, um, they, we talked about it a lot, uh, me and, uh, and Colin and Martin, the audio director, when I started. And like, a lot of my, my stuff for cyberpunk is designed to be layered very heavily. So, yeah, kind of almost. Blade Runner is not really the reference for the game, although obviously there's comparisons and stuff. But uh, okay. we did want that sort of um, multi-layered like, oversaturation of, of uh, like, uh, in terms of the visuals and the audio. Like when you're out in the street, there's just content everywhere. So the music yeah. couldn't be too chunky, really, and it needed to have a lot of movement in it. So I had to design all the music to. to um, it like modulates and moves all through all the music and it's never super intense and it, like, like the music can be quite aggressive but it's never too sort of thick because if you've got a lot of these heavy thick songs with no movement if you, if you stack five or ten of those it just becomes a horrible sort of dissonant noise and so it was an interesting challenge it was cool I had to try and yeah. When I was writing them, I had to sort of move them all around sort of the, the frequency range and stuff like that and make sure that they all stack nicely and it was cool yeah i mean like i mean yeah it's good to be i say vastly you know different from the stuff you've worked on previously because you know i don't know how many open world games you've done but i know that you know having played it you know recently of course i was one of the the initial guys who pre-ordered it but yeah having played it now you do feel like that is that sense of the overload like you walk into the world for the first time and there's just so much going on i mean not just visually but also audibly you know the the people's conversations the music in the background jingles tv news reports people talking amongst their fighting or shouting and you know the the traffic noise i mean it's obviously like any living breathing city there's just an overload sensory overload that's constantly happening um 
and like you said, multi layered. So you were, you know, that's probably meaning that yeah, your adverts or, or jingles will exist in one plane, but there will be so much, you know, within that yeah, spectrum that's also going on at the same time. Yeah, I mean, the things as well. I'm quite curious when you talk about jingles or, or TV adverts and stuff like that. Were you also concepting what the ideation would be behind that as well, or were they giving you uh, briefs or cues for what they needed specifically? Um, they they would send me. Uh some of them were sort of still work in progress um, and they're kind of putting them in batches as time went on, like as, as the, the, uh, the other teams, the artists and stuff were, were working on them, but there was right. me and I would kind of do uh, like 10 or 20 at a time and send them to, um, to Martin and Colin for a review. And then we had mm-hmm. some just uh, chats online about um, direction and stuff like that. Like initially there was a lot more, um, uh, heavy direction initially as there usually is with this kind of thing just while I, I was kind of heading in the wrong direction here and there um right and the, the the biggest and most lasting feedback that i got on it from from martin was that um like my first stuff that i sent him i was kind of thinking this cyberpunk this like 90s industrial vibe to it and a lot of the work that i was doing sounded pretty similar it all had kind of a strong fairly similar identity and he's saying like this is supposed to be like music from a you know, hundred different companies with a hundred different identities and stuff. So you just need to not make it sound like one guy has written all of this music because that's what it sounded like. Right. So I had to come back yeah. to the drawing board and just try and learn as many different musical styles and um, uh, just approach each one as you know, really force myself to be really dramatically different. I, w- I would open up like instruments and things that I've never used before. I learned like new new scales and crazy stuff just just to right make each one sound different from the last so which was yeah. it was really exciting to, to do that it was it was difficult but it but awesome yeah i could imagine as well you know maybe even the instrumentation you would have to seek out to make it sound different i mean i know you know i, I know it's a it's probably really cliche at this point but you know back when i was you know looking at the the early versions of doom before it came out and mick gordon was getting spotlights on the the process he was was doing um i did find it interesting to think you know how he processed audio and even the fact that you know on one episode the, the kind of preview that came out before the game release was like he bought this thing called i think it was a polyvox or it was like a it's like a russian keyboard that like he didn't have any idea how to operate but like just plugged it in and started pressing things and he was like oh that sounds really interesting let's capture that um so i mean in essence were you trying to be as experimental as you could be with with in- instruments yeah definitely i mean thing is because yeah I've, I've got uh pretty much every software instrument under the sun that and a lot of times right you know i'll, I'll uh i get this there's like um companies like native instruments and arturia and stuff like that they got uh, these big sort of bundles of instruments and out of like the mm-hmm. 30 or 100 that, that you get there'll be ones that are kind of my go-tos and i had sort of uh just stray from that that sort of path that i've always been on of like hey I, I know the tools i like to use and just try using things that that i just never had any need for before just like you know Camelands and 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 Rhodes pianos and and like seventies Motown loops and things like that. Just so I just found myself right. just sort of uh, I, I would look at the um, the visuals they sent me and be like, okay, so this has got like a Egyptian vibe, but also feels somehow a bit seventies. So let's see what we got that can do something with that. And um, right, yeah, I really I've kind of just rinsed everything I owned, <laughs> like every single possible tool. Like you know, when I'm down to like jingle number 120, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got to make this sound new. What have I got left <laughs> that I could try? It? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to like like glue other instruments together and try and form some kind of Frankenstein <laughs> like <laughs> mandolin that's never been used. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I think because even with the audio, you know, world, I think a lot of guys will you know because i mean they just don't understand it but we'll usually narrow their mind down to be like oh well use a key use a piano keyboard you've got a guitar yeah. a bass a drum set that's the four instruments that exist right the four horsemen of the apocalypse that's like all the things you'll ever need to make music but then uh even the other week i think i was watching some re- uh, some random clip on a uh, clip from from uh, graham norton and he had bill, ba- bill bailey on and he was talking about this instrument he'd learned in lockdown called the mandala and i was like that's a mandolin right and then but then you know, let alone no, it's a separate instrument. Altogether, it's more kind of earthy, more tony. But there is really, when it comes to music, there is 
a world of instruments out there, right? There's just so much. It's amazing. It's, I mean, it's one of the many things I love about music. It's that it's just an endless, infinite possibility to learn. And like, yeah, I, I, I must know one percent of the available instruments that, that there are to to use and stuff. And it's just just researching it itself and learning about all these weird instruments and things is always such a joy. There's, there's yeah. so much to learn from so many cultures and stuff. It's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think even from Western culture, right? Because I mean, even when you look at a lot of the Eastern culture instruments as well, there's so much. Um, I think there was there was one that my partner brought back not too long ago. It was I think it was from Cambodia, but it's like a small round. It looks like a wooden bowl, but it has metal prongs at the top of it, and it looks like a guitar in the way it's set up. But when you press down on the metal prongs and let them flick back up, they make these really interesting like prong sounds uh, yeah. that like. Yeah, yeah, we probably not talking about. It. That's what I'm saying. When, when you when you even go outside to the Western market, right? There's there's so much even within that, right? Well, there's even there's uh, um, people uh, now designing instruments for for composers that that are uh, sort of very specifically made to produce interesting sounds for film and video games. So there's like the waterphone. Ah. It's, a, it's a, this. It, oh, it, okay, yeah. Alien. It's, it's like a big bowl uh, with huge metal prongs, like two for metal prongs sticking up, and you uh, you bow mm-hmm. it or hit it, and it does those um, uh, iconic, shimmery, terrifying metal sounds you get in horror films. Or there's the the engine engine, which um, I think it's a guy who's he's made instruments for Hans Zimmer and stuff, but he's made this. It's like a big box with weird things stuck on it, and. Um, uh, like wheels that you turn and stuff like that, and it's purely designed to make like the most horrifying, terrifying sounds in the world. And it's just it's a box full of horror. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, like th- there's some stuff that's even like I mean, people who have projects they want to you know kickstart. Funny because I'm about to, to talk about it, but I came across a kickstart not too long ago, and it was called uh, the Theory Board. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. No, I haven't. Okay, I'll need to send it to you later. But basically, it's a guy who's invented an instrument where um, it's like an it's like an LED board. It isn't really like a conventional keyboard. It looks like a it looks like a computer keyboard, like the individual small keys. But the the theme is that um, you can press a button, and as you're pressing the keys, it plays chords uh, automatically. And then there's buttons like just next to it that if you want to have the harmony up or down, you just press that button, and it automatically will play the harmony or the the octave, octave above it, or like it's. I think it's mostly designed as an, an audio synth for people who don't want to learn how to play music traditionally, um, which kind of obviously loses some of the aesthetic of like learning how to play music. But um, it was a really interesting project. I think it's more actually aimed at people who want to make music, yeah. but necessarily don't know how to form a chord on a piano or an octave or span, you know, keys. So, a, I mean, there's, there's that yeah. that kind of, in that sort of thinking, I think like, um, uh, I know it feels like a trend with a lot of, um, composer friends of mine recently that we're all sort of setting ourselves up uh, a different space in our in our homes and or studios uh, moving away from our um, our Macs and PCs to um, to have like a sort of a musical space that, to change our thinking a little bit and I've done it as well, I've set up a um, uh, a piano and then I've uh, got into uh, modular synthesizers so I've got a load of crazy modules and things all plugged into each other but it's disconnected yeah. From from my Mac and and from Cubase and all my regular setup, so that I can physically move myself away from my normal thinking space and try some stuff that is a bit a bit more experimental. And that was that was hugely helpful for um, for Cyberpunk and for other projects that I'm working on. It's just it kind of moves you out of your your your, your normal patterns that have become a little too a little too easy. Yeah, I was going to. I mean, that's that's really interesting. You're you're kind of explaining that where. I know as a visual artist, you know, can I, I paint and draw on a 3D model, but even when I want to do some painting and drawing, I've set up a space away from a computer because, you know, Photoshop's great and it's an industry standard and whatever, but, you know, there's sometimes when, like, you know, you just want to splash a bit of paint across a bit of paper and, you know, maybe not even see how it works, you know, when the pixels fall perfectly in each individual square on the screen. You want to just see how, you know, it moves or it soaks or, it like, it changes colour as it mixes with other things. And I think there's so much emphasis or there has been over the last maybe 20 years on digital skills you know especially because games were so digitally focused but i think because that's kind of been done to death now people are looking for the escape right they're looking for the thing that not everybody's doing or the thing that switches their brain to a different mode right i think you're right i think that's exactly what it is and um it's a real trend with with sound guys i think we're all finding that we've, we've been using uh yeah whichever um music software we use for for so long now that 
I think people were very skilled, but in that software. But yeah, like I, I could, I think I could write a song in Cubase with the sound turned down, and it would be okay, just because I've got so many go-to tools and and you know the basic skills. But I think that's pretty right. Easy. So I really like this uh, new trend of trying to move myself out of that and and listen again <laughs> and and actually uh, sort of use new tools and and avoid safety in, in the music. Yeah, I definitely. We all know the 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 cliche thing as well to say that you know you know you step outside your circle, outside your comfort zone. But it is it is really as simple as that. Like when you take away the even in Photoshop when people are like, "Cool, there's a color wheel that has sixteen gajillion that's a real number uh, colors that are actively ready to be used." But then people have started groups where it's like you know you only get two colors a week, or you know you can only use the round brush and no other brush, and you know and that's great. that limitation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The limitation is what actually makes you more creative, right? So if you've only got like two pedals and a guitar, or you've got like only one piano and no synthesizers, then like, well, how does your sound now translate into other things? That's that's the thing you want. That's that's where the creative really, you know, comes out, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, when it comes to, I mean, you've done, you know, you're doing cyberpunk, you're doing all these other games. Are you still actively a musician outside of your work are you are you gigging are you writing stuff you know solo that's you know you're putting out in spotify and soundcloud or yeah um <clears throat> it's um obviously my, my output for for my uh musical projects outside of my my main work uh has slowed down as as my freelancing and um composing for sumo and stuff has escalated because it's right. there's only a certain number of hours in the day um but i I have uh, uh, an industrial electro band called Goteki that that I've had for um, ooh, uh, tw- <laughs> twenty years now. That um, wow. uh, me and my my bandmate Alistair, we uh, we really now uh, gigs for us are just a, a, a nice opportunity to get out and perform the music, meet people, and hang out and stuff. Like we, we're we're happy with the idea we're not going to be on top of the pops <laughs> i guess there is no top of the pops. it hasn't been for very long <laughs> Show me <there's> no <laughs> but, um, yeah we, um i, I still uh, i re- released an album for, for that band at the beginning of the year and i kind of release cover versions and uh bits and bobs through the year and then i do um uh solo releases just as ross Tregenza on spotify and again uh the output's not a huge amount but um i, I try and release like an ep and uh a few spot songs and a few covers each year and just sort of keep things tracking along. It's, it's, it's kind of, um, I'll do that, that music as like a treat. If, if I finished all my sort of, you know, uh, professional compositional work, I'm like, ah, oh, I've got four hours left. I'll, uh, might do a little bit of uh, a or a little solo project or do a cover of a Bowie song or something. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to think as well how, uh, I mean, even just on a, on a tangent, but, you know, uh, so TikTok is a thing now, obviously, and, and it's it's a very active thing, but it's crazy to see the resurgence of some musicians' work, you know, coming back onto that app and being used as either, you know, people dancing to it or doing, you know, voiceovers or whatever. But um, I think the interesting thing I saw with a couple of people I know who were independent musicians, they were actually making tiktoks with their work um in some form and then of course if it goes viral and people obviously rebrand it and, and bring it back out it then regenerates another voice for you know like that song i'm trying to mind what the song's called but the one the line in it's how bizarre how bizarre and uh yeah like that's been you know you can see people picking up royalty checks for that like 30 years later and they're like what the fuck is happening how why are people listening to my music again but it was the same when like people started rickrolling right across the internet you know, Rick Astley was like, "What the what the fuck is happening? Like, my song is blowing up. What's going on?" Yeah. Um, but do you find that like weird? Have you ever have you ever tried to mix your sound with any social media vibes? Do you think it's something that is good for an artist, or do you try to kind of stay well clear of it? Uh, it's a difficult one. Um, I think it's it's completely valid, and um, I've got a huge amount of uh, respect for uh, yeah, friends in the industry and people I, I don't know, but but who are doing such a great job on. Uh, social media for maintaining their presence and stuff and you know right. things that really really resonate with people and you know they'll you know, get a zillion billion hits and stuff it's yeah i've never had not a lot of luck with it really <laughs> every, every five years i'll try I'll, I'll, I'll think to myself okay i've got such a cool idea this is going to be like a real um viral sensation and it'll, it'll help my profile online it never is yeah <laughs> 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 weekend working on on something and uh 
you know, uh, three years later, it's on like 250 hits. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think it's just the ideation and also just the repetition because I know for some people, you know, you'll see one TikTok that's blown up, but then, of course, it's like, it was like their third and they've already made 50. So it's like, you know, it's going back to one that blew up a few years ago and it, there's no yeah. there's no real rhyme or reason to it. What I think is annoying a lot of creators because you think you'll, you'll have a good idea at the time, but then it might not pick up till a year later, right? That's when <laughs> it blows up or something happens. You're like, why, where did that, you know, it, it's the weirdest thing even... Yeah, even on Instagram the other day, I was like posting, you know, I, I would post regularly on my Instagram and get maybe 10, 15 likes at the most. And then I posted a picture of one of my art books that I got. I got the Dark Siders art book, Joe Mad. And um, it's up to nearly like 100 likes. And I'm like, what was different? What was what was the key element that made that thing more popular? And <laughs> it's difficult. And then even with music, it's even harder because, you know, five seconds goes into a tweet or an Instagram post. But, you know, for a song, you're composing that for... Yeah, multiple hours a day, a week. You know, I mean, how have you tried to maybe utilize social media for maybe not just your your brand, but also your band and your side gigs? I mean, do you do you feel it's helping at all with your image, or do you just try to rely on just putting music music up? I think so. Um, I you know I don't think you can really uh, avoid it or, or be snooty about the importance of it uh, these days. It's, it's it's crucial to to at least sort of make sure like if if somebody uh finds your name in the credits of a, like say if someone's playing cyberpunk now and then they look through the credits and check out all the people that did the music it's, it's just mm-hmm. stupid and, and kind of just um disrespectful to people enjoying the music not to have some kind of uh online presence that, that allows people to find your work and, and how to how to see more of it and stuff so i think yeah there's got to be a, a, a very least a base level of of maintaining all your social media and all that kind of stuff uh, and then you know i'm um in terms of my freelance work uh, like with with cyberpunk at the moment obviously i'm, I'm <laughs> heavily capitalizing on it I'm, I'm i'm talking about it anywhere that i can and uh yeah. updating all my, my social accounts and stuff because um yeah uh other potential people that might want my music in their games in the future will be looking at that so you'd just be really silly not to to capitalize on on the good sides of social media for sure yeah i mean i think it's always the the iceberg theory right where people will look at like oh you worked in cyberpunk this must be your first big break and then you're like no nah. <laughs> you know like I, I worked in crisis i worked in all these different films you know like it's one of these things where even people i know who have worked in cyberpunk now as artists you know people will look at them in the credits and be like oh great you know you finally got to work on a triple a game <laughs> lo and behold they've worked on you know six day beforehand and, and just you know it's maybe not had the social span um but it's like you know it's the wave i think of instant you know uh notification and the wave of just attention once you work on something that big yeah. um that has so many eyes on it because of of course we all know you know cd project red have done a stellar job of you know hyping this game up yeah, to, like, yeah totally so i mean, I mean stupid I, i'd be a complete idiot not to be riding that wave a little bit now obviously i'm, I'm not going to be annoying everyone by still going on every day about about my work in, <laughs> in in a few weeks time but hopefully yeah. for the next week or so while it's in the news and everyone's talking about it i'd, I'd be an idiot not to to to, to yeah, sort of to capitalize on it yeah it makes sense i mean i think it's interesting as well where a lot of artists i think it's even quite just a british thing right like it's the thing where you don't want to talk about your accolades too much you don't want to scream from the mountains that i mean i know people in my life who have phds and are doctors but they don't go by doctor they just yeah. go by gavin you know like it's it's a thing where you don't want to seem you know uh too ostentatious or too yeah, you know i hope it um, feels pretty um uh, uncomfortable to me really i'm trying to to work past it because i think you know that we, we know it's, it's important for for my future career as a composer that i do like you know while i'm in the spotlight right now make make people aware of it but it feels really uncomfortable to me just it feels like boasting and, and <laughs> yeah it's, it's difficult it's good to be yeah uh, i mean in essence you know again you've worked on many triple a you know experiences beforehand but then what do you think was the biggest takeaway from working in cyberpunk you know what do you feel like was one of the major lessons you know maybe you could obviously there'd be, there'd be multiple but maybe some takeaways from from working on that team and on that game what do you feel was your 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 take back in your own work um i think weirdly there's a lot of like uh technical aspects of this one that that i realized i needed to improve on it's like when when I was just a, a, a 
just a, you know, just a musician in terms of I wasn't uh, working in professional games industry capacity. Uh, my sort of project structuring and the way I built my music and stuff like that, I, w- I would throw things in and try and everything was named wrong and this, they'd be called like song one, idea three and things like that. And, and you know, <laughs> everything was just a horrendous mess, but it didn't matter. But and like the the work for cyberpunk sort of escalated over time that I would do some and then they're like actually we think we'd like to do a little more and stuff like that and you know I ended up with 130 um different jingles and each of those rarely they were the first version so yeah I was talking about multiple hundreds of different projects with relevant files and things like that and some point in the middle of that I, I really thought okay I need to be a lot more organized with this stuff so I think um it was good for it's not super exciting but my, my sense of like discipline for my creative work has, has improved dramatically in the last few years it's like particularly right. when when you're working with like external clients and things, and then you don't know when they're going to say, "Actually, can you break that song down and just give us the the drums for that one?" You know, I think you kind of, uh, I can't, I lost them. <laughs> so, oh no, yeah. So you, um, yeah, I think it's been uh, a, a good few years of learning to 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 be a little more disciplined and structured in work from the beginning, and just head off yeah. those problems from the beginning. Yeah, I think as well. You know, with freelance work, it's always different because every single client, every single studio will have a different way of working. So especially when it comes from, you know, one audio director at CD Projekt and audio director at Sumo, like, you know, there's, they all have their own, you know, visual library and their own audio library and their own visual way of, you know, composing and, and bringing things together. I mean, in essence, I think, is there is there one particular style, I think, that you would classify your sound as? Do you think that, you know, you could pretty much make anything at this point or do you think there is like an aesthetic or a style that you have attached to your 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 sound well i think um uh, like you don't never really have the luxury um at the beginning of being a composer of, of specializing that much like if a job comes in you got to say yes pretty much um yeah. what it is but um i do feel like i've, I've got strengths and i if i mean things have been going really well i'm really happy with with the progress in the last few years so if i can start specializing which really is a luxury and i'm hoping i get that luxury then i think uh sort of darker edge tense music more that's sort of more dark adult area as opposed to the lighter um right yeah like sort of um smartphone kind of games with that lighter sort of jingly music or, or adverts with that jingly happy music. Yeah, I can do that right. stuff if I have to, but it doesn't come naturally to me. But things like uh, horror games and uh, games like cyberpunk and stuff like that, uh, I feel very comfortable in that area and I really enjoy that darker, more aggressive tone in the music. So I'm hoping with a little luck, if things keep going well, I can just keep specialising and specialising in towards like, I guess like sci-fi, horror and thrillers and things like that, which have that that uh, aggressive dark edge to it yeah i mean i think horrors in itself you know as a genre that can be expanded upon i mean i know i've watched several videos on on the genre i mean it's never something i've really loved to watch i mean i I didn't particularly enjoy getting you know the jump scare thing where i think that was a very big trend for a long time was the jump scares but um I know that the tense atmosphere you used to have in stuff like, you know, Ridley Scott's work with Alien Mm. and even, you know, when you look at the original cyberpunk, uh, uh, you know, influence, which was Blade Runner, there was so much layering with audio in that that built tense atmospheres, you know, the the, the scene where the guy's like, you know, pushing the guy's eyes into his socket and stuff and you hear the the crescendo coming up with the music and the whole thing's getting all eerie. Um, I definitely think horror is a very tough thing to tackle because it's hard to create that mood, right? It's hard to create a sound you think that will bring people to the edge of their seats and obviously raise the hair in the back of their necks. Is that something that you've tried to be, you know, involved in? Have you ever actively tried to score games of that genre or even tried to think about doing stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, some of the, the, the crisis work, that was more sound design stuff, but um, right. what else have I got? there's been a few sort of horror related titles over the years. Um, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, it's, it's also, um, I think, a lot of modern horror, especially uh, film horror, has tended to, um, it's got a little soft and it tends to uh, sort of, it, it 
guides the the listener in a way that I think is a really bad idea. Like a lot of films will um, signpost something terrifying is going to happen soon. I don't mean that the script is a jump scare, but I think um, uh, in a lot of very modern, very clever horror films like um, Hereditary or The Lighthouse, mm. which um, the you know, there was horror in the music. The, the music wasn't comforting you and telling you something scary is about to happen, look out. It was... Um, it was like disturbing in its own different way, which is really interesting to me. It's, it's certainly something that I hope I get a chance to explore in some way down the line. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, there was something somebody told me a while back, you know, um, about, you know, the difference between sounds and aesthetics and different genres. And I think the horror, one of the biggest things I learned that was interesting for one of my friends, who's a kind of horror movie nut was, it wasn't just about the sound you put in. It was about the sound you leave out. Right. It's sometimes building to, a terrifying moment or something that's quite pivotal in the story can be an absolute, you know, removal of all audio cues. Like the silence is always more uncomfortable than, you know, I think for some people having audio there makes them feel more comfortable in some certain situations. But then when you just, when you walk into a void or a vacuum, that's when the real terror comes, right? Yeah, exactly. Like um, the the film Hereditary was a great example of that because there was, they, they kind of subverted the, the horror film score ideas that they set up like a, um, uh, a cadence and a tone for when something bad was going to happen uh, with like a clicking, uh, repeating rhythm. And then they, they, they started using it when nothing bad happened in the film and didn't use it when terrifying things were happening. So it kind of, it right. out of whack in a way that's just, I think much more interesting than, than, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. The listener. yeah. Yeah. I mean, in essence, I think, you know, when you talk about genre and style, it is something that, you know, will come with many, many years of, you know, freelancing and trying different projects and, and leasing yourself out to different ideas. I mean, I know for the 2D, 3D guys in, in my industry, you know, you want to aesthetically please people and try different things at the start because you want to be open to all different types of work. But then you will eventually find that niche, that thing that you love the most and then try as best you can, basically, to have a career just doing that one thing. Um but then I think also that's a double-edged sword, right? Because that also makes you sometimes feel trapped. I don't know. Exactly. I mean, um, we did the uh, Team Sonic Racing, a Sonic the Hedgehog game, um, at, was it about two years ago now? And you know, before that, I, I think I'd done nine games in a row where you can stab someone in the neck with a knife. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was kind of nice to have something nice. <laughs> and it was a yeah. refreshing game to work on. And um, uh uh, Jun Senue, the uh, composer from Sega, he was a great guy, very talented, and um, he let me do uh, uh, just some music for some aspects of the game. And um, it was a new challenge to to write sort of happy, chilled Sonic the Hedgehog music. That that yeah. was it was it was cool. It was it was it's like a palate cleanser, I guess, between all my all the rest yeah. of other games. I mean. Yeah, I was going to say, because, you know, like you said, with the stabby neck thing, I mean, it's like, yeah, you can only do so much of that before you're like, cool, this is uh, stabbed in the neck, take five <laughs> of 700. You know, like it's, you know, you eventually want to do something that, because um, I think that's what surprises a lot of people is that, you know, you may be objected or, you know, against trying to be like, oh, well, we've got this fun, cutesy game that you want to work on and you're looking at it for the distance thinking, oh, God, what, what am I getting myself into? But then you start working and you start exploring and you're like, oh, man, I'm getting to use, like, instruments and sounds that I never got to use. Like, yeah. this is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is that uh, is that something that you you think moving forward you would still actively seek? Would you still want to try those projects? Yeah, I mean, uh, as much as I love, like I say, all this darker, more... Uh, uh, aggressive tone i mean just doing that forever would be you you're going to lose interest in it and so i mean that's kind of a nice thing with um uh sumo nottingham that that i you know i said do the audio lead and composing for that uh, mm -hmm. we do a lot of work for uh, other companies and we just you never know what's coming in and what new musical challenge that'll be and it's nice it's like it's like a, a sort of a spin the wheel and what is it that we're doing it's like oh cool okay so we're doing something oh. job now <laughs> and yeah yeah that's great and uh, i like that wild card element to my to my composing because the stuff i choose my freelancing or the people that i'm speaking to talking about work i tend to be you know heading towards like yeah like wolfenstein and cyberpunk because they're the kind of games that that I've got a real passion for. So it's cool when you get this, this crazy other element from, from Sumo and gives me opportunities to work on these very different titles like that. It's really cool. I mean, 
in essence now that Cyberpunk has kind of, you know, I mean, there's probably still stuff you're going to be doing, you know, post-release that, you know, you're, you're going to be working on that you can't talk about. But then beyond that, what do you think is like, you know, for for you, what is the dream project? I mean, what's the 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 tip at the top of the mountain? What do you think is something that, you know, you could die happy if you worked on it? Do you know what? I I don't know. I I, I mean, I've already... It's a difficult question, yeah, is. I, I've, I've worked on... Already, I'm looking back at my my um, uh, the games I've worked on. There's there's ones that I'm so proud of already. I, there's no one sort of you know Moby Dick for me. Obviously, there's things like Grand Theft Auto, just because it's such a, sort of a another one of like Cyberpunk, like top of the tree of games that it would just be cool to be involved in. Uh, and um, I think Mortal Kombat would always be a lot of fun, just because it's so comically violent and, and horror film style and stuff. But there isn't really any one game that I could put, hey, I've done that now. I think I, I like that I get deep into a project and, and everything about it and get I get really obsessed with the games that I work on. I, I get really, really into them and, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the fiction of them and stuff. But then when a new one comes along, I, I get just as excited about the new ones as well. I think it's kind of exciting not knowing what they're going to be and i'm just super excited to see especially with with the cyberpunk under my belt now that's going to be really helpful to, to get future work so i have absolutely no idea well besides one that i've done already it's coming out next year <laughs> but <laughs> okay. i can't talk about that yet but uh, no of course yeah. yeah but yeah moving on from that I, I don't know what's next but yeah all of them are awesome it's like working at this level is just so exciting i, I I'll forever feel like just grateful and I have no idea how I got here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely like it's, 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 you always think or hope to have that, you know, the status where you've worked on these great and amazing franchises and IPs, but then when it eventually hits, you know, sometimes it can be great because, you know, you've been waiting that long time for it to finally happen. But then there is always the feeling that, well, that's great. What's next? You know, what's the, next thing to do what's the next thing to work on so um yeah you're never truly satisfied right no exactly it's 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 a funny situation with with the especially with the freelancing because there's so many factors of of you know of just work coming through contacts and a bit of luck and chance and things like that for all i know um you know, I, I, I've had the height of my career and it's all downhill from here. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't think so. I'm, I'm hardworking and I, I pursue work constantly and and, yeah. and stuff. But um, yeah, I have absolutely no idea what happens next. And that's kind of exciting slash completely terrifying. <laughs> As such as the freelance world, unfortunately, that's just that's how it's structured. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that was. I think it's a great point to can end on, Ross. But, uh, but yeah, like, uh, yeah, I think it's a great instance of of uh, aesthetics you've had over your career, and I think you know now that Cyberpunk has landed and you know the words out there and people can read the credits, I think you know you're probably going to be inundated with stuff, um, which I think is great because, like you said, you want to you want to stay busy, you want to be doing different things, so. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's. I think this episode is going to inspire a lot of people, and I think it's going to definitely um, attract a new audience, and and hopefully you know help people who want to get in the industry get into the industry. I mean, I think even yeah, definitely. I think the only thing I would want to try and end on is is maybe just you know, I, I, it's probably hard to summarize in maybe three or four minutes. But what would you say is one of the the key things you would look for for people getting in the industry now in sound design and composing? What do you think um, is something that would help? the next generation uh, follow behind you? Um, well, I think, uh, importantly, it's the industry, it's, it can feel a little daunting and a little like a, like a, a you know, like a, the wall is too high to get into it for somebody that's just made up their mind that they want to become a sound designer or composer. But it's not the case at all. Like, even the, the biggest audio teams in the world are made up of, you know, rarely more than like 20 guys. Quite often it'll be two or three guys. And, we're, we're just musicians and audio fanatics and stuff, and everyone involved in the games industry tends to be very friendly people. So, I mean, um, just if people work on their music, um, get any kind of examples of their music onto onto YouTube and stuff like that. Like, you you have to start somewhere, and people looking to hire sound designers, composers, appreciate that you don't you not everybody's had the chance to work on a game yet. So, it's not. There's no snootiness about that. Like if you have to like strip all the sound out of a trailer and redo the sound just to prove your your skills, then that's completely fine. So just do work, 
get good at it and um, you know, find find a voice and then just get send it to companies and stuff. You, you stand a decent chance of being heard by the right people. So these companies aren't as massive and terrifying and corporate as you think. It's, it's people like me sitting in an office with, with their friends making video games. So. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that's definitely, I think that's, that's a good way to phrase it, uh, Ross. I think, you know, I know, especially for me, even in the 2D or 3D field that, you know, people do think, oh, you know, well, I don't have this experience or I don't have this, you know, uh, accolade on my on my, my CV. But I think as long as you make good work, people will always find you. I think that's that's always going to be the case. So, um, so yeah. So, I mean, I, just to say thanks, Ross, for coming on. Oh, um, it's been really a- awesome. Really interesting to chat to you. Yeah, man, you too. Um, really, really thankful that you gave up your time to speak to us. Um, for anybody who is still listening, thank you for, for being here. Um, I'll leave all of Ross's uh, social medias and descriptions and, and everything down below. Um, if you want to find him or reach out to him, um, all his contact info will be there as well. So, you know, um, I'm sure he's always open to questions or feedback, um, as long as you're always polite, of course, as always stipulate. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you're looking to hire him again, yeah, all his links will be below. I'll leave um, SoundCloud, Spotify, anything I can. And, uh, and yeah, just check him out. Um, this is probably going to be the, the last episode coming up to the end of the year. Um, my thanks to all my guests that I've had in 2020 um, even though it has been an absolute um, clusterfuck of a year, um, we're finally at the end there seems to be light on the horizon so um, I'm hoping next year um, when I rejoin you for another episode um, things will be slightly better um, check us out on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes uh, Google Podcasts um, Stitcher, we are everywhere at this point and uh and yeah just just hopefully you guys have a really merry christmas and a happy new year and uh we'll speak to you later thanks again to ross thanks to you guys for listening and uh we'll catch you later bye guys merry christmas